to another awesome episode of Amazing. because learning in science is amazing. For today, we will be talking about the human respiratory and circulatory system. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain the mechanism on how the respiratory system and circulatory system work together to transport nutrients, gases, and molecules to and from the different parts of the body. If you are ready, make sure you have your pen and notebook with you to help you take down notes as we go along the lesson. Alright, listen carefully and let's begin. Breathe in and breathe out. Notice your chest and belly moving and feel the soft air passing from the nose. Listen to the quiet sounds of breathing in and out. Imagine the air moving from the nose into the throat, through the air tubes, and into the air sacs. Your body needs oxygen to function and the cells are responsible for making oxygen. So how exactly does the respiratory system work? Let's take a closer look now. The respiratory system is responsible for supplying fresh oxygen to the blood, which is distributed to the body's tissues. The inhalation process is when oxygen is brought into your body, and the exhalation process is when carbon dioxide is sent out to the body. The process by which oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged between cells, the blood, and the air in the lungs is also known as the respiration. To understand this, let's take a closer look at the system as a whole. The parts of the respiratory system that are in charge of supplying oxygen are the nose, nasal passages, the pharynx, larynx, epiglottis, trachea, the lungs, the bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, and the diaphragm. Let's talk about this in detail. First, air enters your mouth or nose. There are hairs in the nose that filter out dust and other large particles in the air. Some of the cells that line the respiratory system produce a thin layer of mucus. The mucus moistens the air and traps inhaled particles of dust and smoke. These hair-like structures are called cilia and also line in the nasal passages. Cilia trap foreign particles from air and sweep them toward the throat so that they do not enter the lungs. Mucus membranes beneath the cilia in the nasal passages warm and moisten the air while trapping foreign materials. Filtered air then passes through the upper throat called the pharynx. A bulk of tissue called epiglottis, which covers the opening of the larynx, prevents food particles from entering the respiratory tubes. The epiglottis allows air to pass from the larynx to a long tube in the chest cavity called the trachea or the windpipe. The trachea branches out into two large tubes called bronchi, the singular is bronchus, which lead to the lungs. The lungs are the largest organ of the respiratory system, and gas exchange takes place in the lungs. Each bronchus branches into smaller tubes called bronchioles. Each of these small tubes continues to branch into even smaller passageways, each of which ends in an individual air sac called an alveolus, the plural is alveoli. Each alveolus has a thin wall, only one cell thick, and is surrounded by very thin capillaries. Air travels to individual alveoli where oxygen diffuses across the moist, thin walls into capillaries and then into the red blood cells. The oxygen is then transported by the blood to be released to the tissue cells in the body during the internal respiration. Meanwhile, Carbon dioxide moves in the opposite direction in the alveoli. Carbon dioxide in the blood crosses capillary walls and then diffuses into the alveoli to be returned to the atmosphere during external respiration. Let us have a short demonstration on how your respiratory system works by making a lung model. 
Let's prepare the following materials for this activity. One 2-liter empty plastic bottle, one sturdy straw or PVC pipes, two big balloons and one small balloon, five rubber bands, and a pair of scissors. The bottle represents the rib cage. The PVC pipe represents the trachea. The balloons represent the lungs. And the plastic sheet represents the diaphragm. When we pull down the plastic sheet, the air pressure inside the bottle decreases, whereas the volume of the bottle increases. This reduced pressure causes the outside air to enter the balloons. When the sheet is pushed up, the volume of the bottle decreases and air pressure inside the bottle increases. This increased pressure forces air out of the balloons. We are not respecting hopes continuing learning due to the pandemic caused by COVID-19. But do you know what happens to our lungs when we contract the virus? SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is part of the coronavirus family. When the virus gets in your body, it comes into contact with the mucous membranes that line your nose, your mouth, and even your eyes. The virus enters a healthy cell and uses the cell to make new virus parts. It multiplies and the new viruses infect nearby cells. The new coronavirus can infect the upper or lower part of your respiratory tract. It travels down your airways. The lining can become irritated and inflamed. In some cases, the infection can reach all the way down into your alveoli. As the infection travels down your respiratory tract, your immune system fights back. Your lungs and airways swell and become inflamed. This can start in one part of your lung and even spread. About 80% of people who have COVID-19 get mild to moderate symptoms. You may have cough or some sore throat too. Some people have pneumonia. It is a lung infection in which alveoli are inflamed. In severe conditions, both lungs were infected. The swelling gets worse or your lungs will be filled with fluids and debris. The air sacs filled with mucus fluid and other cells that are trying to fight the infection, making it harder for your body to take in oxygen. Now that we have the basic understanding of how the respiratory system works, what about the circulatory system? How does it exactly work? The circulatory system is the life support structure that nourishes your cells with nutrients from the food you eat and the oxygen from the air you breathe. It can be compared to a complex arrangement of highways, avenues and lanes connecting all the cells together into a neighborhood. Sequentially, the community of cells sustains the body to stay alive. Another name for the circulatory system is what we call the cardiovascular system. The circulatory system functions with other body systems to deliver different materials in the body. It circulates vital elements such as oxygen and nutrients. At the same time, it also transports waste away from the body. But what does the circulatory system consist of? In humans, the circulatory system consists of the heart, blood, and the blood vessels that carry blood to every part of the body and the lymphatic system. Let's talk about each of this one by one, starting with the heart. The heart is the muscular organ that pumps blood to the different parts of the body. It is located at the middle of the chest cavity with its tip or apex slightly tilted toward the left. Its base lies just below the second ribs. The heart is just as big as one's own clenched fist. A sac known as a pericardium encloses it. The human heart is a four-chambered heart, 
the atrium of the heart is divided into four chambers, namely right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, and the left ventricle. The muscle called septum divides the heart into the four chambers. The atria are the receiving chambers of the heart. These chambers are being walled. The right atrium receives oxygen for blood from the vena cava, a large vein, while the left atrium receives blood from the pulmonary veins. The two ventricles are the pumping chambers that force blood out of the heart. These chambers are peak wall. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs through oxygenation, while the left ventricle pumps oxygen-rich blood to all parts of the body. A one-way valve separates each atrium from the ventricle below it. As a result, blood only flows from an atrium to a ventricle. Let us remember that oxygenated blood is carrying more oxygen from the lungs to deliver to the body tissues while deoxygenated blood is carrying more of carbon dioxide to be expelled from the body. It cannot flow in the opposite direction. A wall of tissue called septum divides the heart in half, prevents blood from flowing between the two atria or two ventricles, and separates the flow of oxygenated or oxygen-rich blood and deoxygenated or oxygen-poor blood. Next is our blood. Our blood is also known as the river of life. It transports a variety of essential elements throughout the body. The blood comprises 8% of the human body rate. Can you imagine that? An average shadow has about 5 liters of blood. The blood has two components, the plasma and the formed elements also called as the corpuscles, which are suspended in the plasma. Lastly are the blood vessels. Blood is carried throughout the body by a vast network of blood vessels, which resembles the pipelines that deliver water to the household. The three types of blood vessels are the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. Arteries convey oxygen-rich blood away from the heart, except for the pulmonary arteries that transport blood that has a low oxygen content from the right ventricle to the lungs. Most of the arteries transport oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the body tissues. Starting from the aorta, the largest artery in the body, the arteries branch repeatedly into a smaller and smaller arteries until branching results into the smallest arteries called arterioles. Veins are blood vessels that move blood with waste toward the heart. Blood that enters the vein flows slower and smoother because the heart does not push blood through the veins. Instead, veins have one-way valves to keep blood flowing. Arteries in veins are connected to a very small blood vessels which are called capillaries. The walls of most capillaries are one cell thing. This allows oxygen and nutrients to diffuse through the capillary walls into the body cells. It also lets carbon dioxide and other waste materials to diffuse through cell walls into the capillaries. Acting as a double pump, the heart pumps blood throughout the body in a continuous circulatory system which is divided into two parts, pulmonary and systemic circulation. But how does this happen? In pulmonary circulation, when the right ventricle contracts, the blood is forced through the two pulmonary arteries into the lungs. Gas exchange happens in the capillaries of the lungs where oxygen is picked up and carbon dioxide is released to be exhaled. During inhalation, the blood is replenished and becomes rich with fresh oxygen and becomes bright red, which then allows into the pulmonary veins and into the left atrium. Contraction of the left atrium forces the blood into the left ventricle. Systemic circulation carries oxygen-rich blood from the heart to the organs and tissues. As the left ventricle contracts, oxygen-rich blood is forced into the aorta, which is the largest artery of the body. The aorta carries oxygen-rich blood away from the heart to the smaller arteries. From here, it flows to all the body's organs and tissues. The blood, having given up its oxygen and taken in carbon dioxide from the body's organs and tissues, returns to the heart through the veins. 
The blood from the area of the head and neck travels to the heart through the superior vena cava. The blood from the abdomen and the lower parts of the body flows back to the inferior vena cava. After delivering oxygen to tissues and absorbing wastes, such as carbon dioxide, systemic circulation brings the oxygenated blood to the heart, specifically to the right atrium. As the right atrium contracts, the blood are forced into the right ventricle and the process repeats. So today, we have covered how respiratory and circulatory system work together to transport nutrients, gases, and molecules to and from the different parts of the body. How do you stay fit and healthy during this time of pandemic and community quarantine? Let's find out! Number 1. Get fit! Activities like strength training and cardiovascular or aerobic exercise can help people get the most out of their lungs and can help increase how efficiently they use the oxygen. Walking, running, or jumping rope are just three examples of moderate aerobic activity or anything that moves your body and burns calories has some positive effects on your body. Number two, do not ever try smoking. You know what? According to the research of the American Lung Association, a significant portion of people who were admitted to the ICU for respiratory distress were current smokers or had a history of smoking. Both cigarette smoking and vaping are linked to lung inflammation and lowered immune infection in the lungs. Number three, Eat right. Foods rich in vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids found in cold water fish like salmon and eating fruits and vegetables both help boost the immune response before the virus hits. Building up your immune system and reducing inflammation are both crucial if you are about to get challenged by significant viral infection. Now, what are the ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19? Number one, wash your hands. Be sure to scrub for 20 seconds, then rinse. Number two, cover your mouth and nose with a disposable tissue when you're coughing or sneezing, especially in public places. Throw it in the trash and wash your hands. Number three, physical distancing. Stay away from large public gatherings when you need to be around others and ensure a safe distance of at least six feet. Number four, just simply wear a mask. Number five, seek medical help when you feel sick with fever, cough, or have difficulty in breathing. Definitely contact your doctor and seek emergency care. And that wraps up our episode. This is Teacher Romeo. Always remember, learning science is amazing. Goodbye.